Welcome to Shea Studio. It's our last roundup panel of the menswear season, um, but a really meaty one to kind of dive into because there's so many shows in Paris and so much kind of, so many different things in Paris, so many different perspectives. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people who I spoke to at the show said this season, that it's really hard to kind of pin down a distinct aesthetic or a distinct set of ideas. Um, loads and loads of different things to discuss. Um, I've got an amazing set of panellists with me from all different aspects of the industry. Nice set of boys. <laughs> and to help me unpick what was going on um, yeah, over in the City of Lights. But before we kick off our discussion, I'll just let you guys introduce yourselves. Starting with you, Dan. Okay, I'm Darren Ski. I'm the head of menswear at Harvey Nichols. I'm Chris Hobbs. I'm men's style editor at matchesfashion.com. <laughs> Can you remember? <laughs> I got it wrong last time as well. <laughs> uh, I'm Stephen Doig. I'm the men's style editor at The Telegraph. I'm David Hellquist. I run something called Document Studios and I'm the fashion feature editor at Port Magazine. It's quite intimidating actually when I hear what we all do. It's quite impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to throw it open. Um, in the other cities it's been really easy to pick highlights to say, you know, in London everyone was so excited by, you know, Craig Green or whatever. In Milan everyone's talking about Gucci and obviously Prada as always. But Paris, I actually have no idea what the kind of focus point is. It seems to be so different for mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any highlights? Someone has to speak. <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what stood out for you? <laughs> um, the highlights for me. The show, the shows that stuck out in my mind. Not saying they're my highlights, but things like Valentino and Dries made a visual impact on me. I'm not mm. saying they were the best shows, but they certainly had a real. They struck me somehow. Mm. Um, they kind of left imprints. Yeah, that's after. interesting about I think what both of those houses are doing because it feels like in some ways, particularly Valentino, they're really setting the pace for menswear and, mm, and yeah. it's particularly what luxury menswear is, even things like embellishment or texture, like things that perhaps weren't so kind of pervasive in menswear mm -hmm. before. Did Val was Valentino a highlight for you as well? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, um, you know, there wasn't anything I didn't expect yeah. from Valentino. I think, yeah, as you said, they got a bit of a formula going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was nice, a different way. They were using a lot of denim, you know, yeah. using denim in a real elevated way, which I think was quite a nice. Um, sort of fresh view from them. Yeah. They just do really nice prints. Yeah. And I carry it on each season. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. But it's interesting, I want to kind of talk about who the, like, the luxury shopper of menswear is, because there's a thing that Charlie Porter wrote, and it actually wasn't this season, it was like, it was in, at the January shows, but it seemed even more relevant than it did when he wrote it, Charlie, always ahead of the times, <laughs> and he said, this could be the, one of the most divided menswear seasons in years, talk with most stylists, and they'll admit to falling hip, line and sinker for feminised menswear, for them at Loewe, you know, they're, they're really loving that, but speak with the buyers, and they say, yeah, but of course men won't buy that stuff, mm -hmm. and it, it really got, I just kept, it was in my head all season, um, and I wonder... Is that something that Valentino do really well as uniting those two things? You obviously work a lot with a kind yeah. of a shopper who can afford this kind of menswear. What, what does he want? Or is, is that too simplistic? No, I think, I think, you know, Charlie said he's bang on. You know, I think from a retailer's point of view, you know, our, our shopper doesn't want anything which is too feminine. Mm. And, you know, when you look at Valentino, it has got a masculine feel to it, you know, but they still bring in those feminine traits, you, yeah. know, you know, whether it's use of fabrics, whether it's, you know, a slightly different silhouette. But, you know, I think, our customer, and this is where we, we sort of argue back and forth between retail and from the press point of view, yeah. is that you know something which is you know sort of very trend driven doesn't always relate back to the shop floor. Yeah, you know, we always have to have that commercial perspective on things. And yeah. you know, something like Valentino, you know, you do look through the collection, and you know there is a lot of commerciality. Yeah, you know, whether it be the camo prints, mm. yeah, you know, I think you know that translates very well into that that strong masculine customer. But you know, it can be done in a feminine way. And is, who else is getting that right in Paris? Um, yeah, I think Dries hits it bang on. I found the Dries yeah. collection so weird though. Like, I loved it. Did you? Yeah, I loved it. You know, I think, yeah, it was, it was a bit strange him using Marilyn Monroe as a, um, yeah, an icon really print. Strange. But, you know, I think that's, that's the beauty of Dries. You know, he does things which you, know, you sometimes don't expect. Yeah. Um, you know, he's done it in a really great way as well. Um, you know, across a number of different product types. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the Monroe print as well. It was so, so horrible. That Marilyn Monroe. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, that wasn't for me. Yeah. Still, it's so, like, ubiquitous, that image of her. You mm. know, you see so many t-shirts, but yeah. But then, you know, when it's blown up where it's just the eyes on a, yeah, on a, on a swell. Sort but of it thing. almost, it wasn't dissimilar to, like, Bobby Abley doing an Ursula print. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on Bobby Abley. <laughs> <laughs> David, what did you think of Drew's? You're staying quiet. Well, <laughs> what to say? I mean, I, we all love Dries. I think that sometimes 
I mean, it's his prerogative to, to go outside of his comfort zone, yeah. or what, what we perceive to be his comfort zone and what we think he does well. I suppose after what, I don't know, 15, 20 years, you kind of want to progress that. And, yeah. you know, um, we always talked about him as ethnic in his inspiration yeah. a few years ago. It's been less of that lately. And then now, boom, all of a sudden, uh, Marilyn Monroe. I also thought that last season was, was a bit of a kind of move away from what I've, what I've liked of his yeah. in the last few years. It felt, that to me, felt quite feminine mm. uh, last or season before that. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like... It's, it was all about her and I've never, I don't think we've ever seen him focus so much on a specific, let, forget about the person, but like yeah. a, a print, a, a graphic yeah, if you like. Yeah, usually his are so cluttered. And yeah, rich. they're all yeah. about like the, the texture and the fabrication and, and that's, you know, so th this was... But I think it's, when you go to a showroom, you know, that's what you do see. So you see all, yeah. all the stable bits of, of Dreese that you of come course. to expect and, you know, these are... Yeah, the bits are going to sit on the shop floor and people are going to resonate to yeah. straight away. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's that, that draw into a space that you need when you're, when you're looking at a, a collection. Mm. But I mean, that goes for all designers, right? Like, you know, what's on the catwalk? And I think that there are almost two different panel shows, like yeah. the showroom panel and mm -hmm. the catwalk panel, yeah. because we always say that, oh, yeah, no, who's going to buy that? But Dries, more than a lot of designers, what you see on the runway is what you get in the showroom. Much more than a lot of designers, uh, yeah. I think. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But that, and again, that's kind of why, like, that's why, especially me, you know, like I always look for wearability, yeah. even in the, in the catwalk collection, sometimes you struggle, but you know, quite often I find it, but like in this case, I don't know who's going who's gonna to buy those, um, you know, oversized Marilyn Monroe prints, but I, you know, to go back to Valentino, I think that's where they get the balance completely mm -hmm. right, because they, to me, if they f it feels like it's about garments, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know, you mentioned the denim and the camouflage, like, you know, a lot of luxury houses, they, they, they dip into streetwear and uh, contemporary culture, but yeah. like Valentino really picks out the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the varsity jacket, the denim jacket, yeah. the field jacket, uh, uh, which people love and people love buying. Mm -hmm. and, and they do them in, in A, a luxury way, and B, a Valentino luxury way. Mm -hmm. And boom, all of a sudden you have an aesthetic, you have an mm -hmm. image, mm -hmm. and you have um, direction, but also, you know, uh, products that people can buy. It's hard though, isn't it, when you get kind of when you hit on a big success. I think Valentino have had it with the camel and I guess the stud as well and I, I think Fendi with those kind of monsters and it's kinda of like how do you take that forward when a kind of almost like a key product becomes bigger than the whole of your aesthetic as a whole? Mm. Like because I, I can I think Fendi obviously is not Paris, but with Fendi like that's a monster. Mm. I can that is such a clear image, but actually I couldn't really tell you what Fendi's menswear images as but a whole. And I that think that is I think is so crucial, isn't it, for yeah. brands like any sites. We notice that, you know, it's not just about like new London designers coming through or from or from whatever city, about finding something that that we perceive to be them. Yeah. Apparently uh, brands like Fendi and Valentino need it as well. I think that's yeah. quite telling that, you know, even they're like clinging onto these studs and they're clinging onto the cam camouflage. Yeah. You know? I mean, I love camouflage, but like five years down the line, mm. maybe they should mm. kind of like move on from that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's tricky that though, isn't it? But then I think there are some designers in Paris where they, they're so clearly kind of completely have an aesthetic. I thought the Rick Owen show this season was really fantastic because when you look at someone like Rick, it's just, it's, it's not on par with what anyone else does. And there mm -hmm. are people trying to do it as well as him, but mm. he's got such a clear aesthetic. and. I think it's remarkable that someone can, maybe it's the same for someone like Craig Green in London, it's remarkable that someone can come out amongst all that noise and have something that feels completely his own. I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. That's Who why I like Le Maire. Le Maire? Yeah. Because he all? does something like, he does something, or they, do yeah. something that's very distinct and very different from everyone else, but super luxury and it's super, I don't mm. know, it's really popular on our site. Our whole editorial team love it. Mm. The buyers love it. I don't know. It's just and it's so such good colours. It's it's hard for someone like fits. Christopher Miller, isn't it? Because you you think that the runway is so kind of like it's so hard for him to make an impact with the kind of clothes he makes. Mm. I don't yeah, know it should, should be a presentation. Do. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you? I go to those shows and I love them. Mm. And I think they're you know serene, plain, beautiful, like clean. But I don't really get that. I mean, fair enough. They do it in a different way as well. So they're not like a kind of a you know, long catwalk in that sense, but yeah. you do feel a little bit, it's a bit like going to a Margaret Howell show. Yeah. Yeah. I love the clothes, yeah. but I don't need the catwalk. Yeah. Mm. It's yeah. quite interesting, some of the presentations I think in Paris were so much better than the shows as well. You know, mm. I think just picking yeah, up something like Sakai, 
Yeah, yeah from a presentation point of view, although it still had a lot of movement within it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it just stood out as one of the, the, the key key presentations and probably a lot better than some of the shows. I mean, to me, actually, yeah. I almost saw Zakai as a show rather than a presentation. And I think that was actually my favourite show of the season. Yeah, yeah Sakai. Uh, you know, they've always been great, like the presentations, but this felt, because of the, um, what is it, Centre de la commerce, bourse, whatever, it's, it's just <laughs> French. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> French were a big roundhouse anyway. Uh, it's, it's just a great setting. Yeah. Paul Smith was there for a few seasons <laughs> uh, and it just worked and the clothes just really, I mean this, you know, talk about wearability, like, yeah. you know, there's so much, mm -hmm. so many pieces in here you, you want to actually wear. Mm. It's interesting, sorry, go ahead, David. No, I was going to say, I mean, to the point where you look at that, those three in a row, so just disappearing. I mean, they're just a bit grey, aren't they, in a way. Mm. But at the same time, you've, you, you look closer and, and you can do in that kind of presentation slash catwalk scenario and you see that they're awesome pieces. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think there's a sort of a weird disparity almost in where we're heading now with presentations versus shows. There were yeah. some shows in Paris that I can felt maybe didn't stand out as being you're ready for a show. Yeah. They could have done well in presentation. Other presentations, I thought, should have had a show. Mm. Um, Mark Jacobs stood out for me mm. when I went to that presentation. I thought it would be fantastic to see a show. And Balenciaga as well. I'm surprised whenever they don't do a show as yeah. well. I, I think it does work really, really well in that kind of small showroom atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But I think there's such a... The women's wear works so well on the runway and I'm surprised that they haven't expanded out into... But I think it's a hard thing, isn't it? It depends. And I guess this goes back to kind of what we're talking about, the difference between editorial and, and styling. And, and then when you have the, the retail, it's like, it's what you deem the show to be for. And I think, I think designers themselves and houses themselves are really struggling with that. Because on one hand, it's this massive kind of PR exercise of trying to get your name out there, get loads of social media mm -hmm. out. But on the other hand, it's trying to show people your clothes. And I think it's mm -hmm. a really kind of confusing time for how to present and like, you know, I sit at shows with buyers and they don't really actually want to be at a show, they'd much rather be in a showroom where they can actually like look at what they're going to buy and it's, it's a really, really strange time. But that's, that's funny for me, you know, coming from the buying sort of side as well, you know, the excitement should come from the show. Yeah. You know, I think from a buyer's perspective, you want, you want theatre on the floor, you want something that's going to really invigorate the customer mm. and that's going to come from the show, you know, although you know, 50 to 60 percent of your product comes from the pre collections mm. you know, that, that little top, bit on top is addressing, that's what makes the retail environment is so exciting, mm. you know, and, and for a, a buyer to say, you know, really, it's, they, they don't get excited about shows or that's mm. not what they look forward to, I, I find hard to, to fathom. I think it's the pace, isn't it? People are just kind of like, oh, I can't put it in. It's strange though, isn't it, Good, because do you not find for your, your customer, your shopper, it's quite confusing for them because they can't get this product straight away, so it's kind of like, the show is so exciting and brilliant, but then it's not going to be available. Yeah. Is that becoming more of a problem? Yeah, I mean, you know, for the last probably three or four seasons, we, we get guys coming in with images straight off the catwalk. Really? You know, asking for products straight that they've seen on style.com or, you know, yeah. wherever it might be. Um, you know, that, that's more prevalent now than it's been for a long, long time. Mm. Um, and you're absolutely right, you know, they come in expecting to see these pieces. But, you know, you look at something like Dries, um, you know, all their product gets delivered at once. Yeah. You know, there's no pre-collection. So there's a number of collections now that don't have a pre, yeah. or have never had a pre, so. Is that sustainable, not having a pre, though? I think it's sustainable, but yeah. you know, I think from a retailer's point of view, the, the more you get into a pre, you know, the, the better your sell-through is, the better the profit is at the end of the day, so. Yeah. Um, but you know, there are a number of, of brands who just have that, that main collection, so mm. customers can come in and buy it straight away. Yeah. And are you more inclined towards people who are offering kind of buy straight from the runway? Because there are a few who are kind of tentatively yeah, trying. Yeah, they're, they're trying it. You know, some some of it becomes a little bit gimmicky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as as interesting as that can be, you know, we try and stay away from that gimmick side of things because it yeah. just upsets the balance a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's great to have one every now and again, but you know, I certainly wouldn't want too many of them coming around. And often the only thing you can do when it's kind of buy straight from the catwalk is something like a t-shirt with a print on it because you don't mm -hmm. have time to put it into production. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel that's even and David actually? I guess when you're cons when you're kind of talking to your to your readers that you're aware that like that confusion about when they can actually buy the stuff that you might be talking about. Yeah, definitely, I do. You know, I do show reports immediately, but then going into the print publications that we do, you can kind of, they're long leads, so it is you know it's a. I guess you kind of you want to wait and see what settles. Yeah. If, you know what, not even trends, but what kind of mood settles for autumn, winter, for spring, summer, um, and you know what what sticks out. Then what you might see at a show is very different 
you know that you come out buzzing about yeah. might be very different six months down the line when actually there's a new mood in the zeitgeist there's kind of a new cultural landscape mm. that the the clues work into better mm. that's mm. what i feel yeah um no i don't think so i never had that kind of like sort of feedback that mm. where can i buy this now kind of thing that's interesting i, I mean because you, you kind of we always talk about it being you know spring summer 16 or something yeah. like that. Mm. so it's kind of like says in the in the title I just think there's such a divide, isn't there, between what we, the fashion pack, find exciting and interesting and what an actual... Which is maybe why a brand like Saint Laurent is so interesting, because it's something that we're all talking about, but it, it's so far beyond the kind of melee of fashion week. It like, appeals to so many people and it sells so well. And actually, mm -hmm. like, I, I just find it remarkable for that, that level of communication, how he has really proved that actually it doesn't really matter what, you know, whether the magazines, kind of like the big glossies care, like what you're doing, you know, he's not seating them at his show, what have you. Like, what's everyone's, what does everyone think of this collection? You know what, this, when I sat down for this one, there was the first time I, uh, I kind of realised, well, I mean, not the first time, but I just sort of said to myself, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, back in the day, pre-internet, those catalogues, they sort of, you just bought, you got like a catalogue and you just flicked through, and it's just like a long <laughs> list of products. It's product after product after yeah. product after product. There's no sort of, if you like, theme inspiration, except for the obvious one that he mm -hmm. looks at subcultures from the 50s and 60s and 70s yeah. and 80s, you know, all of that. Like, they, And to be fair, I haven't sort of sat through and gone through every single Sonoro show since he took over, but to me, any of those pieces could have been for any of those collections. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, it, it's not, it's stopped being a seasonal uh, fashion brand, mm -hmm. it's a product based brand and ironically that's kind of what I said earlier on that that's you know I like that you know the products the, the yeah. of Valentino and so on but to me if I can't distinguish it from from spring summer 16 or autumn into 14 then it kind of loses the point and mm. I just don't even see why it should be you know part of a, uh, a Paris catwalk schedule just, do you not think just publish a catalogue yeah but do you not think seasons anyway are so kind of no one's doing a kind of distinct proposition for summer versus autumn, yes you're right yeah. but he this doesn't for me this is no difference between now and three years ago yeah actually okay. i'll take that back it's no difference between now and you know seven eight years ago when he left the on. so why does everyone love it so much why is it selling so well <laughs> <laughs> silence i think he's tapped into a seduction that it's a very seductive image that mm. he offers of yeah. i would going to say manhood but boyhood even yeah. If you're an 18-year-old kid in California, that's what you want to look like, if mm. you want to be cool. And he's just got a magic formula for it, I think. This mm. of whether that 18-year-old kid in Cali can, can afford to, to yeah. buy into this. You know, mm. that, that's the disconnect I get. You know, this is so focused towards that 18 to 23-year-old, that real skinny guy. Mm. Yeah, and you know, it's the fact that half of those kids can't afford to buy into these, these collections, you know. Yeah. And that, that's how I, fi I find it difficult to see how that translates, mm. um, but clearly it does. Mm. Well, I think what's weird about it is it's not, I don't even know if he's trying to appeal to those kids as much as kind of take their style and sell it on to someone else. Because those kids, they're going to be wearing like just old beat up denim and the real mm -hmm. vintage jacket mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. the actual band t shirt, not like a. I, I love going like, sometimes I like going into like the seller on concessions in stores and actually looking at who's buying it because they are like not cool people at all. It's <laughs> like. <laughs> like kind of older women buying a spangly jacket it's mm. so removed from that notion of like subculture and 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 streetwear but it does just completely fly doesn't it It does really well mm. for you it matches isn't it yeah one of the top sellers and the really jazzy pieces as well mm. are always the first things to fly out and what do we think about the way he's operated i know it's a bit of a tired subject now but like continuing to just not really court press not advertise with the typical titles is it refreshing like should we all be catching up and going actually it's proved that traditional media doesn't matter as much or do they even have an Instagram account I don't know no I don't think they do they don't advertise no. with like GQ they don't do they just don't do any of that stuff that mm. everyone thinks you have to do that in itself is nothing wrong with that yeah you know and ironically it kind of goes against everything that's with the clothes because that what you just said is 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 new it's it's modern yeah. uh, but but to me uh, the the clothes are vintage mm. so it's there, there's no connection between like how he runs the, the the company and how he runs the 
collection. Yeah, the way he runs the company. But I don't know, I think the company, the way he runs it is quite old school. It's like a refusal to listen to criticism. It's like the designer in a kind of like... But that's not new. I mean, yeah. people have been banned from shows for, what, well, by him for, forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that I find a bit funny. It's like, it's all about like being edgy and true and raw. And then he's like, but I don't want to hear it if you don't like it. <laughs> Did anyone notice the, the ticker tape that came down at the end? Had what? The ticker tape or the glittery stuff that came down had um, YSL. Yeah, it was the YSL logo. And you know, how long have they gone on about it's not YSL anymore, it's SLP, so. Yeah. yeah I thought that was quite an interesting, I, th I think it's, things like that are just done for, for making a big talking point. Yeah. Mm. But I do think you can't, and I was thinking about this across Paris, you can't underestimate the effect that, the way he rebranded that house, the impact it's had on other rebrandings. I think what's happened at Gucci probably wouldn't have happened mm, yeah. without him sort of setting this precedent and proving how well, like business-wise, it can do. And yeah. I also think, in a way, Loewe, the way yeah. J.D. Anderson has been given kind of carte blanche to yeah. turn that into kind of this strange kind of like fay odd house where you can buy like lovely leather goods. It's just very, it's very different the leather proposition that he was. But I suppose offering. it shows that because if you look at Sonara and um, you know Loewe and um, Gucci, you know like they what they do now is very different from what they did before, and it, it kind of talks to like a lot younger uh, androgynous audience. But I mean, and as you just said, those are not the kids buying these brands because yeah. obviously they don't have the money. They just, I mean, it's because it's aspirational stuff, isn't it? You know, you have like. 35, 40 year old uh, dudes looking at, at the Saint Laurent show and they're like, oh, I wish I could wear skinny jeans. Mm. Oh, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> and unfortunately, they do. But, you know, <laughs> so, as, you know, Gucci is like, it's, how many guys are going to be wearing those, you know, bow tie blouses? Chris. <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> Except for within the fashion, uh, you know, industry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. But, like, you know, obviously, they're not going to. You know, sell, and that yeah. doesn't really matter because it's about rebranding the, the Gucci in this case, so that it completely stands out and has an impact uh, within this group, mm -hmm. and then later on within a greater sort of um, yeah. you know uh, purse perfume buying audience, mm. and that's when they kind of the, the energy of the brand is is um, you know well, it's just have a new lease of life, doesn't mm. it? Mm. I think in a way, it's great that designers are kind of have that clout to to do this because yeah. you know previously it might be the case that a designer is meekly answerable to a ceo and it's a very softly softly approach yeah and in these three cases it has not been that at all it's been a sledgehammer to the the codes of the house which yeah. has been completely rebuilt mm. and in a way it's it's showing that that designer has a kind of carte blanche to yeah but i also think it's shoppers i i don't know if they would remember it. I think we we overestimate when we say codes of a house. It's kind of like I was thinking about this with Dior because the fact that Christian Dior was only there for actually ten years. So you know, are the codes of those ten years more important than the codes that I don't know, like John Galliano set mm. the whole time he was there. And it's I think that's interesting what we deem a house to be about and how actually how fluid that is. And you yeah. see that, like you see it with sort of you know someone like. Eddie Smith, I think what Saint Laurent is to a certain generation means something totally different to what it does to a different yeah. generation, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And maybe that is that is the only way to kind of get a new a new audience in. Mm. I think a house that I want to talk about, which it kind of relates, it's not about rebranding, but I think it's been really interesting to see um, their identity defined as Louis Vuitton because I thought this was a really really strong season for Kim Jones. There, mm -hmm. what, what did everyone else think? Did we like? What was going on there? It was a really fun show. Felt, um, look at these f uh, first three looks. It's quite different from just a couple of seasons ago when it was yeah. very, you know, high tech sports travel wear kind of yeah. thing. It's obviously yeah. where they come from. And I think I was looking through Autumn Winter 15 yesterday for, for another thing. And even there, there was this slightly more, I don't know, directional, if you like, yeah. approach to it. And I quite like it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a richness too. I mean, you couldn't turn up to that show and not have a smile on your face that the yeah. face mm -hmm. that was involved in it. And um, there's just a richness and a lightness and a kind of sense of having a lot of fun with the, mm. the stuff. It's not too, you know, he's moved on from the technical aspect, he's moved mm. on from sportswear, and it's something in between that's a bit more joyful, I think. I find it interesting there was so much kind of um, really visible branding, like, you know, the Louis on the... 
and on the neck scarves, like there was Louis Vuitton on the back of everything. It seems, like, is it the case that, would you say oh, it's such a tired like thing, but like logo mania is back. It feels like brands like Hood by Air, Off-White, that they've kind of, it's kind of trickled up and now people, no one can get enough of names and stuff on. Yeah, do you know, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that we try and read as retailers. And, yeah. you know, that there is no way of reading it, to be quite honest. You know, yeah. go through seasons where the whole Versace, Moschino thing yeah. is massive, and then all of a sudden it's not massive. But then you've got You're Vuitton here. You're like 100. Yeah, and then you've got Vuitton here yeah. is starting to, to do the same sort of thing. So, yeah, I think at that lower contemporary market, I think absolutely is, there's a lot to be said from the hood by airs and the off whites. Yeah. Um, but you know, from, a, from my perspective, you know, I, I want things to clean up a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm over that that overt branding. Why do you say that? I just think you know, I, I've had Versace on the shop floor. You know, I've had yeah. all the big things that are very synonymous to Givenchy, you know, Moschino. You know, I think a lot of those things are just they, they get a little bit in your face. Yeah. You know, I think certainly from our customer and where I see our customer going is, I think they're trying to clean up their their wardrobe a little bit. Yeah. You know, I don't think there is that guy who's you know, overtly dressing as mm. much as there was maybe two or three seasons ago. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm a little bit over all that big branding, but, you know, you see something like this and it starts playing with your mind again. Yeah, am, I, am I dipping out something too soon? Yeah. But so I think this is very different from Versace branding as well. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Yeah. So, There's you know, e even when I see that, that branding, I'm, I'm not like, whoa, what's going on here? I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of like, because it's not on every single thing as well. Yeah, and, yeah true. Um, I don't know. I don't mind it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't mind it. Glowing and people are less peacocky at the shows, I think, as well, like yeah. pretending. Yeah, definitely. Attending, but outside. It's a yeah, different yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, the more seriously going in. But I do think that's interesting. I think that kind of, um, I, I got a bit obsessed this season with them. Um, the number of designers who were trying to make new clothes look old. I thought that was quite interesting how so many people were start, like either styling stuff or actually make them, making them to look like they'd been really, really lived in. We saw a lot of it in Milan, like Thomas Mayer always does it really well at Bottega, but like pieces that look kind of old. And I think that it is that same kind of notion of cleaning up your wardrobe, actually, just like those great pieces that you do wear all the time rather than kind of show pieces. Who's getting it right? You know, when you say you want to take your kind of your guy in a certain direction, who was there anyone this season where you were like, that's actually more how, how things should be done, other than the ones we've gone through? Um, Bowman, for example. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Bowman's that overt customer again, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, that, that actually that contradicts everything I just said. You know, Bowman from being a very obvious brand yeah. um, is probably one of our biggest brands in the mm. store at the moment. Um, yeah, you know, we, we we can't we can't supply the demand of uh, yeah. certainly the denim. You know, it is a predominantly denim led business, but yeah. and it's interesting to see a catwalk. Um, show for the first time for men's um, just because you know I think he, he, he opened things up a little bit and, and yeah. probably from the consumer's point of view who knows it as a denim brand it just opened their mind mm. to say you know actually do you know what there are of pieces it is very you know obvious and in your face but yeah, you know, there, there's a, a very very wide customer base who are buying into this and you know it's interesting when you look at some of the sort of hip-hop stars around the world who are, who are buying into this brand, so yeah. denim, you know, they're making it more mainstream. Yeah. You know, whereas I think before you was just getting that, that real fashion customer buying into it. So the guy who buys Bauman, what else does he buy now? Um, Givenchy, then he'll buy Dan in Contemporary for things like Off-White, mm. um, Fear of God. Yeah. You know, so I think they're completely mixing things up, whereas I think historically you just have a customer who just like predominantly shop in that fashion yeah. arena. Um, they're now shopping, you know, across departments. Mm. What should everyone else think about? Uh, you know, I just think it's interesting that uh, Balmain is one of your best-selling brands and Saint Laurent is one mm -hmm. of your best-selling brands. And even though I don't subscribe to any of those aesthetics, I, I, I think it's great that, you know, there is an audience for, for that kind of diverse, um, you know, looks or, or, or yeah. attitude and style. And it's great. I mean, you know, it's just, just because I'm not the customer for it doesn't mean I don't welcome that diverse clothes. But, yeah, it's... it's um, it's not for me. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's interesting. <laughs> just saying that customers go from different brands, but you know, you're saying earlier about Rick Owens about how that's always been quite a niche, yeah. niche customer. Well, the Rick Owens customers buying into Bauman as well. Really? Or, or vice versa. You know, I think that Bauman customer is mixing with Rick Owens, and you know, again, I think there's certain brands which that scares me. That man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a pair of you know black bikers from Bauman with like yeah. you know, something from from Rick, a long length tee, yeah, or double layer tee, jackets and stuff. It, it, yeah, there are true. yeah, there's crossovers. Mm -hmm within the two collections. It's just, I think customers are being a little bit more brave to, to try different things out. And I think it's interesting. One thing I was wondering a lot this season is, is, is it very easy to kind of, um, I guess, like steal from a, from a brand and kind of set yourself up as the new, we were talking about it with Marcelo Bellon in Milan, how that was so hot, like 
three seasons ago and now there's someone who it's so easy to just swoop in and become the kind of cool new thing. I was looking at the Dior Homme show and it, and it was kind of sad in a way because I thought this was a brand that was kind of such a leader and so relevant and I think the guy that loved that and went to that, he's going to San Laron now mm-hmm. and I think how easy it is to kind of hook a shopper and take them away. Mm-hmm. Um, it just doesn't feel like it has that relevance anymore, does it? Do you like it? You look like I mean, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a balance between, you know, the strict tailor, well, the lean tailoring and something that's a little bit more experimental that he stayed quite true to. And yeah. I think if we're, you know, we're saying about Raccoons that actually having a clear aesthetic that you always put forward is yeah. respected. And I think he still, uh, Chris does that still. He, yeah. he marries these two clashing opposites mm. and, like, you know, he does it well, I think. I think it's just hard to- yeah, I think it's just that the pace of fashion I think has made it kind of. But the pace of fashion has had his uh, victim as well because obviously now he's not doing his own line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now he's he's you know, I'm guessing been sort of told to focus on Dior Homme. But yeah. I I think that Dior Homme is is in a healthier state than it's been for a long time actually. Mm. I look at the last few seasons and uh, you know I like a lot of it. There it's was a, a few years in the beginning. Mm. Sorry, camo, camo, camo. yeah, camo. <laughs> good, good timing. <laughs> yeah, but a couple of seasons ago, when he did that quite denim heavy collection, yeah. um, and you know, and he, as you just said, like he takes that, and it's not just the denim collection, but it's not just you know the suits as well. And I think you know he came from a um, came from a place. I think in the early Dior Homme years under Chris, it was very much like his own line, and mm. uh, it took him a few years to kind of like find different sort of places for them mm-hmm. to uh, yeah. and then you know he, he, he just about managed and then now he he's gonna have to focus on just the oral and you know I'm sure that's just that's good news I suppose I think I just I think what I what I struggle with it is I think it's such a cliche to say but like the best brands at Fashion Week are the ones that have a really clear point of view and I think I know it's kind of a, a pointless argument to be like oh if Raph Simmons did all of Dior because obviously there's just not the time for him to do that and it wouldn't happen but I think to see this after you see something like Raph Simmons' own collection where there's such a kind of like clear point of view such a clear perspective and you have that at Dior in the women's wear I think there's less of that in which is maybe a thing with men's wear it's just harder to do something that's so kind of like this is my idea but but I think you can if you see that with someone like Raph's collection it's just much more there's much more conviction behind it perhaps Mm. Did we like Raph? Part of the models that fell off the runway, which was really upsetting. <laughs> he started out pretty well, though. It, yeah, but one of them was really hurt. He had to like cancel all the rest of his show. Did he? He jumped yeah. straight back on, though. He, I think it was <laughs> shot. Because <laughs> <You dunk them. laughs> <laughs> didn't he like throw down his bag and then jump on? Yeah. Yeah, it's like weird. Why would you drop the bag? <laughs> yeah, because they were on a raised platform, which you can kind of see. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty chaotic, that show. Um, and actually, it wasn't one of my favourites from Raph for the last few seasons. Was it not? Why not? I just couldn't see it. In- interpreting it into the shop floor and again it's this whole thing about shop floor versus you yeah. know, um, editorial um, you know some of the products there I think the lengths were really tricky um, again the fabrics you know you can see this one that's just coming up on the little tank top mm. um, you know some of these are really hard to translate to our customers mm. um, if I had slaves <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> What I think is interesting with Raph is that, you know, when he took over Jill Sonder and started doing men's and women's for Jill, I, th- yeah. I thought that his Raph, the main, his own line, went quite bad because yeah. it was like he focused all his attention, mm. time, and energy on getting Jill right. I'm yeah, sure okay. that's like tricky. Yeah. And then a few years ago, a couple of seasons ago, kind of when he started with Dior, just doing women's, yeah. I felt that there was this you know Raph Simmons the brand was re-energized partly actually because he sort of started, started looking back a little bit yeah. to you know, his old school aesthetic and you know I think one of the reasons he worked as well is because he used um, what's his name um, Sterling you know to yeah. help him yeah. do yeah. that it was a bit like a retrospective but like instead of doing it himself he got someone yeah. else to help out yeah and that and that re- worked really well and actually I missed this show but so I wasn't there but I think you know, uh, in the last few seasons, it's actually exciting me again. Yeah, I do think it's really smart what you say about the interplay between, I've said this on panels before, but like the interplay between what he's doing at Dior, what he's doing under his own label, they're so different, but there's really interesting 
like sort of takes it can be something as specific as like the number of buttons he's using or the fit of certain pieces but also like the general ethos I think at Dior he's got quite obsessed with youth and as you said the passage of time and I think that's having a massive impact on the kind of mm. like the intellectualising yeah. behind his campaign because the old ref was all about youth yeah youth exactly rebellion youth yeah. energy yeah right and that's kind of what he's and this was all like Fear Richie Made Me Hardcore which was like obviously like really nostalgic all about youth culture I, but I think it's another example where I love this as from a kind of like there was so much intellectualising you could mm. do around this show so maybe that's why it really appeals to me I, one question sorry go I ahead. just thought it's got really nice colours really nice shapes mm. I really like it you'd wear the trousers wouldn't you I'd love <laughs> uh, this one crop sweater <laughs> all over that <laughs> did you like it Stephen? Um, for me I, I enjoyed it but I missed I think it stood out yeah. but um, I missed the show but I was looking at it in style afterwards you know, it stood out but I love the tenderness of last season and yeah. kind of that gentleness. I mm -hmm. love. I, I thought it was fantastic. So for me, this is a bit too much of a departure and a bit mm -hmm. too yeah. hard and Agree. industrial and yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I asked this yesterday and no one had an answer. So maybe you guys will have the answer. I thought it was interesting. It was kind of goes back to what we we're saying about Sakai. Is everyone this season? Well, there are a lot of people this season who were looking at club culture, and I know club culture has an like, is an eternal kind of like inspiration to designers. But it felt like kind of nostalgia for clubbing of old. Like you saw it with um, Sakai was all about Paradise Club, you know, seventies and eighties, and this was obviously Fear which you made me hardcore. And then in London, you had Chris Shannon doing the phone parties. There was a lot of that focus. Why is that in the air? David, <laughs> you're a writer, you have good ideas. <laughs> oh, same thing as those old dudes buying on our own jeans, isn't it? It's yeah. about like wanting to, I mean, I, I think we all do that, you know, like we go back to a certain time that helped define who we are and what we like mm. and what we don't like, and you dip in and out of that. And, mm. and because we're, you know, older, we can't lift the, the, the entire aesthetic, the entire lifestyle. Because yeah. I sure as hell don't want to go clubbing to five o'clock every morning <laughs> again. I've so, seen you uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, you take like the trousers or the t shirt or the trainers yeah. or, or the music or, you know, whatever, and you sort of inject that into yeah. what you're currently doing. And that way you, you're, uh, you're renewing something but with blasts from the past. Strange that everything was so nostalgic, though, wasn't it? From the Marilyn Monroe's to this to like you know, that's like Northern Soul trousers and like nineties, it's like kind of like rave pieces. And there's not, I, I felt like everything was very about looking backwards. You know, everything looks quite antiquated. I wonder why that's so appealing. Well, everything's quite. It's. How am I going to explain this? <laughs> <laughs> everything's quite commercialised now. Yeah. I don't, like, what is the? I don't actually. I'm too old now. But what's the London club scene like now? Yeah, not very good. Fabrics <laughs> being. Oh no, fabrics still going. Yeah. Turnmills has gone, and yeah. the end has gone, and all those massive clubs from the nineties have gone, and I don't know where the kids go out, but it doesn't seem to have that same. I suppose if you'd have asked a generation above us when we was going to those places, they wouldn't have known what yeah. when we went. Mm. And we had just as we grow, yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah, but I, we had a bit of a, that new rave thing yeah. going on, at least. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> at least we had something. Yeah, I do think I do think that's I like there's a bit point. less of that now. So I think people to are seeking it out. To just go backwards. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's. I always find it weird how obsessed young people are with old stuff, like mm, really mm. obsessed with like old catwalk shows or old campaigns, and mm. like like you know you saw that quite literally at Louvre, like old campaigns reused. It's really like I think it's a strange time in fashion that everyone's looking backwards so much. Like we all talk about how pacey it is and how modern we are, but everything's so. I suppose one reason why like a lot of these you know like modern day luxury houses are inspired by that kind of time and place is because the guys and women designing those brands today are like you know our generation yeah when they grew up with those sort of things and you know gone are the days when um, I mean, look at Vuitton you know like Kim Jones took Paul Elber's place you know yeah. he was probably a generation older than him and all of a sudden yeah. you have this like early 30s yeah. mid 30s dude who like us grew up with a similar kind of music and mu um, club scene and, and rep yeah. pop cultural references but then he's obsessed with the 80s, like everything he references is like too old for him anyway. That's what's so weird, it's just that persistent. But I wonder if that's why, I think it's interesting, I was talking to other journalists about the show to see someone like Raph kind of doing youth culture when you have someone like Gosha doing youth culture when he's actually young. And I think that's quite interesting is, is 
where, where it feels more current because I think everyone loves Raph and they think it is amazing but then I wonder there's such excitement around someone like Gosha and I wonder if it is just because it's he's referencing things that he's actually seeing he's not referencing kind of through a rose tinted glasses in any way but Gosha is great because he's you know like I mean is this luxury I don't know but it's <laughs> it's certainly clothes yeah. that I want to wear because what is luxury yeah. <laughs> well exactly <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, hey, it's produced by by Com, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, so that, does that make you luxury? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a, it's a really lower price point. Than yeah, it is. Yeah. It's lower than um, than the other Com brands, for example. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this this is this is great because it it doesn't even when Louis Vuitton or one any of those brands try to reference these kind of like you know uh, cultures they had to do it in a way which sort of fits with the brand yeah and, and it was feeling a bit yeah maintains yeah. some like I mean how do you reference hip hop or whatever when you Louis Vuitton you know yeah. and do that in a good way but Gosha doesn't he doesn't have that problem yeah. because he I'm not saying he's hip hop but he's he truly is that of that generation yeah. or, or that or his brand is as well like, and it's it, so about kind of Soviet life and his upbringing and like yeah. those kids it's so yeah and that's why it's believable, and that's why yeah. you, you know it's it's uh, it works. Do you like? Are you guys fans of Gosha? Um, I've looked at the show. I think it's. I like the energy behind it. I don't think it's right for our reader, so yeah. I kind of don't really engage with it much because we've got a you know possibly more traditional classic reader mm. than we engage with this. But it's interesting to talk about. I don't want to get in a really boring debate about what is luxury because we'll be here for <laughs> that hours. But it is interesting. I think to a, to a kind of to a certain shop of things like this and things like off-white it, it is luxurious to them they're not interested in the same thing like that the tactility that we kind of i think associate with traditional luxury you know like mm. whether it's to do with fabric or cut or whatever i don't think that's the same appeal it is much more about aesthetic and about mm -hmm. codes and would you would you agree yeah, with completely that? you know i think look at where take off-white as an example look at where they position themselves in the market yeah they don't have the history that the big fashion houses have obviously yeah. but you know, they, they sit quite nicely next to the Givenchy's, the Bauman's, the Ricks yeah. of the world. And, you know, that's where they, as a business, want to be sort of situated. Why is everyone obsessed with it? Because it literally sells like crazy. Why? I think it's just one of those things which, um, you know, it's got a massive underground following. Now, the underground following is, is so much bigger than it's ever been before because yeah. of social media. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, you look at the way that um, Virgil's sort of grown originally Pyrex and now Off-White, yeah. he's grown it via almost like a reverse method. He didn't go through retail first of all. We had yeah. everyone, the appetite for it before he actually hit any retail store was massive. Yeah, yeah. You know, us as a retailer, you know, I remember us against a couple, couple of our competitors trying to get yeah. Pyrex when it first came out, you know, literally. Yeah. Well, it was hard to buy. As a shopper, it was hard to buy. As a buyer, it was hard to yeah. buy. Like, you couldn't find it. Yeah, I mean, we, we had races with the other retailers to get to, to Virgil to try and secure yeah. it. and. Yeah, he was very, very clever initially about where he placed the brand. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think he's, he's creating that demand initially and then, you know, ramping up through Instagram and social mm. media. So, you know, I think he's been clever that way and now he's just positioning at that level where it is considered an international designer brand. Mm. And where does Hid by Air sit in, in that mix? Because Hid by Air, I think, pushes it. It's, I think it's potentially speaking to it's, it's much less kind of hetero than Off-White is, for example. Um, is, is, it similar, is it a similar guy? Um, I think it's a similar guy, but I, I don't. I don't see this sitting next to the likes of Givenchy. I don't. I think it's yeah. a, a slightly different customer. You know, it's slightly more feminine in the way where yeah. it is. And you know, Shane's had quite a you know quite a, a big impact in terms of that contemporary market. And, yeah. Know, we've we've had the brand for a number of seasons now, and it's it's continued to do really well, even though he's made it even more of how he sees yeah. the product should be. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, th I think it is actually a slightly different customer to that off-white guy, mm. even though it's very heavily branded as off-white is. Yeah. Hood you know, by Air just feels more of a designer's brand than off-white because, uh, you know, off-white to be fair is quite graphic. Mm. It's a lot about mm -hmm. um, uh, logos and yeah, chevron. And yeah, yeah, and you look at the the pieces; they're quite plain garments, as you were. But you know the. <sighs> There's a lot of design behind this, and I think, yeah, I think yeah. sometimes it's over-designed. Yeah. yeah, I think that it, it doesn't have that simplicity that Off-White has, and yeah. therefore it doesn't translate into to money in the till. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a lot more, it's a lot more difficult to wear Hood by Air than Off-White, for sure. Mm. Well, this collection was particularly kind of like nuts. Like, <laughs> the show was nuts. Yeah, the show was really, really nuts. And so kind of um, rooted in kind of like counterculture and subculture which is fantastic and it's really exciting to see but like so many kind of like codes and 
nods and nuances within it. It was much less was off white. It's much more like you see what you, you get mm, in yeah. a way. Um, but I think it's important that someone's kind of. I think it's interesting. We talk a lot about gender on these panels, but I think to have a designer who's like speaking kind of authentically to sort of trans audiences is interesting. I don't think you're seeing that from other. Yeah. You see a lot like we all talk about Gucci being mm. genderless or whatever, but yeah, I don't. This think. this truly is, isn't it? I think, yeah. You know, Shane's done, as I said, an amazing job with the brand over the last well seven years, I think six years, yeah. um, and then he's now getting the recognition I think he deserves because yeah. you know he's a talented guy. And he, as you said, he, he's, he's got a look and a feel, yeah. and he, he's not moving away from that. You know, that's, yeah. that's what he's all about. And you can see the show is becoming more about you know, how he feels about the product, rather than trying to sort of give the audience what they want. What they want, yeah. You know, he's actually putting his own stamp on things, and I think you know, you've got to take your hat off to him for doing that. Mm, absolutely. From, it's interesting that we're talking so much about kind of authentic culture because a show that came under a fair amount of flack for appropriation was Junya. I don't know, did anyone go to the Junya show? Cause mm -hmm. Yeah, what, did, what was everyone's take on that Junior Watanabe? Because there was a lot of talk that this was because of the use of kind of like ethnic um, elements, kind of nods to certain, well, not even nods, like taking elements from Africa, but the casting didn't really reflect that. Mm. There was a lot of talk that it was kind of real criticism for it, for cultural appropriation. What, what does everyone make of the, of the show? And is, is appropriation a problem in fashion? Big questions. <laughs> <laughs> No one wants I guess it, you, it depends on how you how it's done. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, if it's done with respect and done with intelligence and nuance, then I think it can be it can lend something new. Yeah. If it's done in quite broad brushstrokes that border on offence, then yeah. To me, I, I didn't love this show. I I didn't go, but I had a look online. I didn't think it was the strongest. I think yeah. last season was really striking. Yeah. Yeah. Last season really was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's. Probably, I'm, I'm probably guilty of being hung up on that. I need yeah. to move on a bit, but, <laughs> um, but I didn't love this, and I didn't love the um, the the ethnic element. Yeah, I think it's hard because no one was quite sure how to read into it because obviously it was shown at like the Museum of Immigration, and some of the fabrics were done with I'm going to pronounce it wrong. I think it's Vilsko, is how you say it, which is that company that supplies fabric to Africa. Yeah. And they have okay. done since like I think it's the 19th century. So in some ways, I think I people thought this was kind of meant to be about appropriation maybe or about kind of um yeah actually okay. kind of tackling the themes that it got accused of ignoring in a kind of strange way but but it's difficult i think in a in a way Did, who, what was your sorry i was going to say i mean who knows what he was thinking because it's not like they communicate these things yeah <laughs> is that it's part not of very problem, chatty <laughs> so. but do you think it, i i think appropriation is a big problem in fashion i think people I think it's something that is is dangerous and it's, it's difficult and it's interesting to see. It's, it was so interesting to see something like this alongside. You know, we see designers like doing a culture or doing a kind of look or a feel when you have designers, someone like going back to Gosha, who's just like actually kind of producing things that relate to things they've lived through. It just, it, it, like, it sounds flippant, but it just doesn't even feel that modern in a way because I think people like Shane, who we were talking about from Hibayer, where they do things that really relate to their point of view, it just feels a bit more, yeah, a bit more relevant because mm. it's, it's more authentic. Did, did you like the show? No, I mean, I was going to sit on the fence on the show, to be quite honest. You know, I yeah. think, same as what you're saying, I got hung up on last season's last season. You know, one from the product point of view, but also yeah. from the actual atmosphere and the ambiance of the show, show, which was amazing. Yeah. And I came out of this just feeling a little bit deflated and I, I just couldn't really fixate myself on where the, where the theme was going or what yeah. the trend was and yeah, you still got the obvious junior yeah. staples going on behind there but I, I just didn't, didn't quite get it. Yeah. When you say, you know, um, like it just it wasn't quite like a strong enough show for you, what, what do you look for in a show? What makes a great show? A uh, number of things, you know, obviously product is key but yeah. you, know, you need to live and breathe what the designer is actually trying to get across to you. Yeah. You know, that Sunday, I think it was a Sunday morning last season where Junior yeah. had that show with the guys yeah. dancing down the catwalk. You know, you actually lived it and you breathed it and you actually, yeah. you got romanced by everything he was putting on as well as the product. Yeah. Whereas here, even the, the product, when you look into it, it's good. You know, the rest of it just didn't romance me. Didn't, that's interesting. Is that the same for you, for you guys? Is it, is it a similar thing where you're looking for something where you kind of like, I guess you believe in the aesthetic? I think you want a story as well, you know, I, yeah. as a journalist you want to come away with a bit of a story, whether it's how something is made or 
be the romance behind something or the journey that the designer's taken or I don't mean physical, you know, haven't gone off to India and come back with a ton of... Not everyone's convinced. You know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you want a, a rich story behind it and you want to come away with a clear message for your reader. Yeah. That, to me, doesn't come away with a, a hugely clear, you know, I'm still flummoxed about exactly what I want to say about it, which yeah. is probably not a good thing to mix on. It might be me, but I mm. just wouldn't know how to communicate that. Talking of stories, what did we think of Tom Brown? Because that had quite the narrative. <laughs> so, Tom, King of Showmanship, which, this was, is really, you can't see it from the pictures, but it was like, firstly, like the longest show ever. Um, all the guys in the kimonos kind of were on when you walked in, and then just so our viewers can understand. And then um, they were kind of undressed slowly and ended up walking around in these bits of tailoring, but wearing these kind of like, um, tabby socks and shoes which made it very very hard for them to mm -hmm. walk so it was incredibly show, incredibly slow is there still a place for this kind of catwalk theatre I, I loved it did you in, in terms of just the, the show itself you know I thought it was um, it's just that little bit of interest you know you go through so many shows and I think London's a little bit guilty of this where it's all in the same venue and it's all yeah. very very same and you come to something like this and this is why I love Paris so much is you do get these pops of, of yeah. brilliance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, you, you've got something that you're going to remember for a long time. You know, you walk out of it, you hark back to Rick Owens when he had the thrash metal band yeah. being hung from the ceiling. I was genuinely scene. terrified during that show. Yeah, I, mean, like, it's funny, I was but scared. People are going to talk about that. You know, yeah. Certainly, if you was there in the audience, you, you're going to talk about it for years to come. Yeah. And maybe not talk about the product, but the actual feel. Yeah. And, you know, that's what Paris does so well. It takes you to, to places that you don't expect. Yeah. That's I think that's true. the only way that catwalk shows will survive is if they become Pieces like theatre yeah. like yeah. people will start to get really tired of 46 looks just going down the catwalk yeah. and that's it well I think it goes back to what we were saying about pre doesn't it mm. in a sense is it's like those aren't even actually the most important collections anymore mm. so it feels weird to kind of yeah. expect to sit and, and I think if what's happening in the women's wear with those kind of massive cruise collections if that kind of starts happening in the men's wear which I'm sure it will at some point, you know, like journalists being flown to these kind of nuts locations mm. to see these amazing, they're kind of, the, the showmanship that's happening at those shows, it rivals what used to happen at the Couture. And I think you're right, I think, you, I just, I don't think it's sustainable, this method of us all kind of flying around and looking at, at catwalk mm. shows that aren't that interesting, where the clothes aren't even making up that much of the retail. It's yeah. like, what, what was it, the Chanel show? I don't know, but Julianne Moore was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's what it's gonna be like. <laughs> Just talk about the shows as well, it's quite interesting, I don't know if everyone else agrees, but the amount of female models and, and women's wear actually yeah. parading on the men's, mm. men's show scene. What do you guys all think about that? Because so people are really split, some people really love it and they think it's really progressive, some men's wear editors are like, I just look away. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite fabulous. It just feels quite cynical. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to shoehorn some more women's product in there. But it must yeah. be annoying from a very kind of businessy perspective, because I guess your team that could even like buy or select the women's wear just aren't at that show. No, is not it? at all. So is it, it must right. just I mean, be a waste of looks. Yeah, really? a complete waste of looks. But um, yeah. Yeah, again, it just adds to that that element of surprise, I suppose. That, you, know, yeah. you don't expect to see Naomi Campbell walking down the catwalk for yeah. men's Givenchy yeah. in a Hokature autumn outfit. So, <laughs> yeah, which, yeah, again, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it livens it up a little bit. You know, yeah, you, you, do, you do sort of, yeah, there was a big gasp around the, the audience when, when she came out. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's excitement again, you know. Mm. Yes, it's yeah. not men's product, but it's the excitement of the show. I was interested you don't mind that much, because I think... Well, yeah. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. a one-off, I mean, like, yeah. cause, and you did that because she, it was her, and she came out, and you were like, oh, wow, cool. But, like, generally speaking, I think it's not, not just a waste of looks, because sometimes what they do is they just add them on. Yeah. So you'll end up with 50 looks, yeah. 35 uh, male and uh, you know, men's wear and 15 women's wear and, and you know. But it's fair uh, to almost split now, like Prada and Saint Laurent, it does get to the mm, point where it almost yeah. feels like half a men's yeah. and half, like Prada yeah. the invitation actually said like the men's and women's show, like it well, wasn't even. You know what, I'm, the day when they start do, showing men's wear and only women's wear catwalks, I'm fine with yeah. it, mm -hmm. but yeah. not many people, <laughs> not many brands do, so yeah. until then, <laughs> keep out, it keep out. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it what it what it does is help push towards a mood. You know, if you are yeah, that's very trying true. to put a mood across, then having the clothes translate into your women customer as well, and yeah. how that entire collection works. You know, a conversation between the two genders yeah. is interesting. For me, you know, it's difficult because we have people. My colleagues cover women's wear. I don't. So I literally, you know, my pad pad is down. I can't 
cover yeah. it. So it's, yeah, because you know, yeah. it's, it's not just like men's buyers, it's men's press there. Yeah. yeah. So really, it speaks to very few people. Yeah. There's so few press, I was thinking about this, and I, I think it might change with the younger generation of journalists that come up, but like, I do think it's, I don't mean this is criticism to you, but I do think you need press who cover both though. I think it's very hard to do just one now because of not just like I think because so many designers operate in a way where what they're designing for their women's effects what they're doing for their men so you kind of need to know what they're yeah, doing yeah but I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't cover both I'm, yeah. just, I'm just not interested in covering women's wear but, yeah. like, but you know it's the men's week we're there yeah. to cover men's wear and women's wear will have its time two months later but I it? wonder if that's the way that we've all talked about kind of the pace and the number of shows I wonder if that's one of the ways where actually they could kind of make that calendar more manageable is to start having it more unisex rather than having yeah, but that only works if you completely take out like one of them, right? And, yeah. And just merge the whole thing. Which I'd love to see all the men's wear press with all the women's wear <laughs> and press. And double the size of the venue. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. the venues yeah. need to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah it would Absolutely. be a disaster. <laughs> it would be but it, for two I, months. <laughs> <laughs> I, think you, I think you're right. I mean, it's just to me, it's quite cynical because you know yeah. that all they're doing is flogging their uh, pre-collection. But that's why this was interesting because this wasn't pre and I think this is perhaps why it worked so well is it felt... It did really feel like the girls were there to complement the story Which of the Which one is this? And this Shinonshi. was Shivanshi. And the girls were actually wearing couture. Yeah. And so it was shown ahead of the couture week, which was really exciting, really smart for him, because obviously um, kind of like pipped everyone to the post with the couture. It was couture. autumn couture, wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. autumn winter yeah, yeah, couture. Yeah, yeah, so it was yeah. absolutely beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't really show couture anymore at all, but has this amazing couture business and really set the pace for modern couture. Um, so I think it made much more sense than having the... It wasn't like he just threw in a few kind of sellable women's lips. But did he then do a couture show two weeks later? No. Okay, no. well, there you go. So yeah. that's yeah. replacing something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, the, all the other guys, all the other brands, just shoehorning in, like, more yeah. more uh, female looks that we will probably see somewhere else later on anyway. Yeah. I did think this was a, this was one of my... I'm not a massive Givenchy fan, but this was one of my favourite shows. I just thought yeah. it was amazing. It's, it's been no, the best, best yeah. Givenchy show for, uh, for a number of seasons. Yeah, definitely. It felt a bit cleaner. Yeah. But I also thought it felt cleaner in the aesthetic, but the show was quite like dirty, which is why I quite liked it. It was like super sexy, like you could like smell the boys. They were like really sweaty. <laughs> and it was great. But like it felt like you? there was like a real atmosphere. Do you is know that, what I mean? It's a good mm-hmm. thing. No, but like in a good way, it just felt really like like there was like a lot of energy, and the pace was really good, and yeah. the music was really good, and like I think you know, just sometimes it just works at shows, sometimes it doesn't. It's like I think it happens with Drees a lot. Sometimes the shows just feel really like pacey and amazing, and sometimes they don't. But mm. I think. But, yeah, go ahead. I agree. Going back to what we were saying about, you know, where are we going to, the catwalk show, you know, the situation yeah. with that, you know, Tom Brown. This was a real show and I loved it. I, I loved the fact that the public were pressed against the kind of, the, that strange block we were all in, yeah. in the park. Um, and it, it reminded me that there's a huge public appetite beyond our mm, little yeah. rarefied world yeah. for fashion shows and yeah. for the glitter and, you know, the, the full impact of a real stonking great show with Neil Campbell in yeah, sparkling like mm. couture <laughs> and men prowling around looking, you know, alpha male. Yeah, the public actually got um, a view of the um, rehearsals beforehand. Yeah. So obviously it was completely open. Mm. Um, and we speak to the guys and, uh, you know, they, they don't off well, you never get that, do you? you yeah. know, from, from a public point of view, you know, they've done an amazing thing of just sort of, you know, opening themselves up. Yeah, definitely. I thought you were right. It was really smart that. And, it, and it, I think it was smart to two senses and one level it's just like way more social media way more kind of mm. like mass hysteria around your show yeah. but also it kind of like it just stopped that kind of sense of like fashion feeling like it was kind of inward looking do you know mm. what I mean and it made it like for you the fashion press to go and see all these kind of like tons of kids outside it mm. made you feel more lucky to be there yeah. you, often yeah. you walk into a show and you're like you don't feel that sense of a lot of people complain at Fashion Week, you know, you don't mm. feel that sense of, I'm so lucky to be sat here. And I think you kind of felt that there mm. when you could see these kids like pressed up against the, yeah, the wall trying to look at it. Have yeah. we missed anyone? There's a lot of people we haven't talked about Con, we haven't talked about, um, we haven't talked about, who else? We talked about Walter Van Buren, we haven't talked about Amy. There's a few people. Are there any other highlights that I've really missed? It was an odd mm. season in a way, wasn't it? I don't think it was. It wasn't a standout season. No, I don't think it was. It wasn't anything I came away and thought, you know, that's the best thing I've seen for, for a long time. But is the current, I just don't know if the current kind of climate, all the things that we've just talked about, whether it's kind of conducive to strong seasons or mm. strong shows, I think it's really hard. But I think what you said about harping back to, you know, the past as well, yeah. whereas I think maybe go back two or three seasons when sportswear thing was all really new and fresh yeah, yeah. and it's pushing the boundaries that, that way, I think 
we're just in that flux period at the moment where yeah, you're not sure whether true. to go for a new new direction or just to go back and reference something from the past. Yeah, definitely. Does everyone agree with that? I think that's completely... Mm. Yeah, I mean, this season didn't stand out for me. I, the reason I brought up trees before is because it was an argument <laughs> over, you know, <laughs> as they say, go Winefield in you know, yeah. Paris having dinner and half the table hated it, half the table yeah. loved it. But, so the, you know, those things kind of stood out in my mind, but there was yeah. nothing that, that I, nothing that I think will set a tone that will change, you know, the mood for the seasons to come. No, which is a, sh- which is a shame because I think in a way it's odd to say that that's kind of happening in Milan because like it or not, I do think Gucci has kind of like thrown down this thing that everyone is kind of talking about it and I think it's having a trickle down effect mm. and, you're, and you're seeing other designers look at it and you do think Paris in a way should be the place for that where something changes fashion a little bit. But it's yeah. nice that it moves around a little bit, you know? Yeah. Like You're like, give them a go. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let, yeah, yeah. Have a go. <laughs> well, should we give the designers a round of applause to wrap things up? <laughs> yeah.